This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Ooh. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's been both uh, sobering and daunting, I think. Uh, I've never been in a position where I've ever given a lecture, well, once, so, but n- normally keep the public and the private separate. And I've never been asked before to uh, indicate my background uh, as a prelude to talking about anything else. And I've been thinking, oh, can I say that? And the various conversations and bits that really ought not to be recorded or publicised. So I demand the right, whoever's behind that, uh, to edit it afterwards in case I uh, inadvertently slander somebody. Um, so really this is a partly, there's three things really, partly self-examination uh, and partly analysis. So it's rather like being in the psychiatrist's chair and also being the psychiatrist and it's sort of looking at myself and it's been quite interesting. Um, what I try to do is really um, look at some problems, both theoretical and practical of the field, and I don't, I'm not sure I'll be able to get through the lot, which reminds me I'm going to set the timer going. Um, I'm going to, if I've got time, and I've been advised if I don't have time to dump the theories, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I gather this is a room of historians apart from the people I know, so <laughs> you may not be interested in organisational theory, um, and inter- sort of interact the problems with a little bit of social policy background, but not very much. I'm not a wouldn't call myself a social policy expert, and I think it's, it's more the, the general flow of social policy that I would uh, comment on, but also a, a, a centrepiece, if you like, or core of the presentation would also be about the various institutions that I have had the chance to either set up or be involved with and their influence or, or, or lack of it. Um, so, I suppose it's a bit like a train journey. Um, it will be travelling through at a fairly rapid pace in some points, and at other points it might feel rather gently travelling through some perhaps interesting countryside, uh, stopping on the way and, and perhaps getting a little bit confused and lost as well as I might expect. So I'll begin, if this thing now works, um, with some personal history. Now. If anybody gets fed up, just do this. <laughs> I'm very sensitive. As you'll see, I spent 15 years of my life working with one of the uh, foremost psychoanalysts in the world. So um, we picked up a few hints from him on the way, but we'll come to that shortly. So this train begins in 1945. I'm not in that actual picture, but. Um, My earliest memories, I suppose, or some of my earliest memories were at the age of five, being sort of going with the schoolmates and chums being shoved on a train and going to somewhere we we never knew. And um, it was an experience which in itself was not terribly significant. I've tried to pick some of the influences out, but as a whole, the war was an enormously, and the after effects of the war, and what was um, discovered as a result of the war, played an enormous role in my own future life and what happened to me, and I suppose uh, how I looked upon things and how um, I did what I did, which I'll come on to uh, shortly. I was during the war at about seven or eight different schools. Um, My father was in the army and we sort of followed him around. And I was the other half of the war during the Blitz V1 and V2, and my main memory of the V1 was being taken to White Hart Lane, which some of you may know has a certain football team there. Please, if you support that team, you may exit the room now. Um, And um, watching, as were 60,000 other people, the V1 come over the ground and then Every, everything stopped. Everybody went silent and people started counting. The this, this thing stopped. Just wondering whether the actual thing was going to drop its load or dive and into the, the ground. Or, thankfully, it, it moved on. Um, 
so I covered the territory of, the, of England from Blackpool to Nelson to Oxford through to a whole range of other places. My next slide has nothing on it because by far the most important influence on my life and many other Jewish youngsters uh, from the East End of London who uh, were sort of settled in that area and brought up during the war was the impact of the Holocaust, uh, both on our life choices later on um, and on, I think, a whole load of other things which I'm not prepared really, I couldn't actually analyze them. Um, I think the impact of the Holocaust really was what you might call the, the three S's, the search for security, the search for social justice, and the search, well, it's not three S's, is it? A new way of life. I don't know how I put that down, but a new way of life. And that was something that, if you imagine a, a group of youngsters growing up, uh, with the impact of what that meant for them as sort of young Jews, um, weren't particularly religious, but most of us weren't religious. In a, in a sense, the, the war had the impact of destroying most of our beliefs in, in, in religion. I mean, it was difficult to reconcile religion with what happened, and um, many of us took to alternative paths, as, as um, I show you here. Um, but one of the good things that happened to me was that I was very fortunate in going to, or getting, it was the grammar school in the scholarship days, getting a scholarship or passing the 11 plus exam, whatever it was called, to go to Hackney Down Schools, which was then part of the grocers, or called grocers historically, which is a very unusual outfit. Um, if any of you know people who have been there, you'll appreciate that. It was a sort of boiling pot or a cauldron of youngsters who were interested in and politics and literature and all sorts of things. So it was a great um, education supported by a very impressive band of teachers who also many of them, we didn't realize it, they all looked terribly old to us, but actually they only just got out of the army or somewhere else. And it was, headmaster was a major with a former major with an MC, um, military cross uh, and so on. And very much into sports and literature and all sorts of things. And I, I was, I don't think I was fortunate, but this four years younger than me was uh, Harold Pinter. And um, his, even as a young man, his influence sort of permeated in quite a remarkable fashion, quite charismatic in his own way. And um, I still, I have for your interest a unique piece of Harold Pinter's statements, one sentence, I was a young lad of about 14 and he was in the upper sixth form and um, oh no I was younger I think I must have been 12 or 13 and he was the dinner monitor the head of the table and you have to remember Harold Pinter had that voice that you recall even when he was about 12 but he was 17 or 18 so he stood up and one young kid next to me or down the road had spilled a pee onto the table and Harold stood up in a very commanding dramatic fashion pointed his finger and said take that revolting pee off the table and for some reason uh, that phrase has stuck with me all my life <laughs> <laughs> now if we do have a psychoanalyst here you might want to explain why I remember that one but I do um, so yes and uh, as somebody um, when I was at school before I uh, went up to Hackney Downs at the age of 11. It was this time of the 1945 elections. And the thing I remember there, and I mention it because I think it's sort of indicated where I was going, standing up at the age of 11 in the class elections about which party you support, making a speech for the Labour Party. I have no idea how I had the guts to stand up and talk about something I knew nothing about. But it seems to be a trait which has stayed with me ever since. <laughs> So being prepared to stand up, hopefully saying something of some uh, interest. Um, but with that sort of background, not being religious, I ended up in a um, youth organisation. Ooh, what have I done? Here. Um, which was, again, a rather strange mixture um, of, on one side, scouting. I, I, I don't know what you thought that was. 
<laughs> but it's actually <laughs> please stop those laughs it, it was actually the, it is a scouting uh, signal and the other side is the red flag which is a sort of socialism so it was a mixture of socialism plus scouting plus obviously uh, uh, Zionism since it was a Zionist youth movement but it was a real concoction which um, was fascinating and had I was there from my, all my youth at the same time even when I was at university ended up being general secretary of the outfit but all my time I was there and that sort of uh, was I, I suppose um, it, it, if the school gave the security and that, that we, we were looking for after the war. This gave a sense, being part of a youth movement, gave a sense of being part of a, of a family, really. You had a lot of youngsters, um, boys and girls, and the girls were important, um, who came together and went camping and did things together and had an ideology, and it was qu uh, quite unique. With a left interest, if you like, it was inevitable, I guess, that I went into... Um, into the LSE. It was a choice of one of these other Ox Oxbridge places or the LSE. And LSE had one of my heroes there, which was... Um, I've forgotten his blinking name. <laughs> <laughs> Who can help me remember his name? Um, Marxist philosopher... It'll come back. Anyway, it's a long while ago and he was a hero. There were a number of them, other people as well were at the LSC. Um, and so I thought, this is great, I'll go there. Uh, Harold, Harold Lasky. <coughs> Don't know if anybody's ever read any of this stuff, but it's Harold Lasky. And he was one hero, and I thought, I'm going to the LSC, it's great, we'll have plenty of uh, socialism and whatever it was. And of course, about two months into my uh, first year, I got an invitation from one of my tutors was a professor of something or other, uh, to his house for reception. And, uh, you know, a lad from the East End going to the house, being met by the butler at the door, who announced us, that Mr. David Billis, you know, and I thought, you know. So I think there was always that tension between Downton Abbey and socialism at the LSC, which <laughs> to some degree has never, never uh, left it. Um, well, my next move was perhaps one of the most interesting ones because I moved from there about the age of 22, um, went to uh, Keyboards, which at that time was a, a genuine collective and in the years after was attracting a great deal of attention from young people and others from all around the world as, around the, world, as um, the archetype, if you like, of a new way of life, which was, I think was the other thing we were looking for. When we left school, joined the youth movement, some of us um, took the path I've mentioned, and others joined left-wing groups, and others just went away and made some cash or something, whatever they did. But basically, a lot of us were looking for a new way of life, and the kibbutz at that time as a collective and a, <coughs> uh, organization, mainly in agriculture, offered that sort of new way of life, and it did at that time. It, it was exciting, um, it was dramatic. Um, that's a picture, actual picture of uh, uh, the kibbutz as it was when I arrived. It had been settled about seven or eight years earlier. And I worked mainly in agriculture there, and, um, but one day we had a crisis. Uh, I don't know, it wasn't filling the books, just sheer incompetence, and the whole account system was totally screwed up and they decided since I've been to the LSE I'm the ex exact person to take control of the accounts department. I mean firstly I knew very little about economics in my first degree because I was specialising in government and um, isn't much help and I knew nothing at all about accountancy. Nevertheless I spent some years uh, in um, the accounts department and did various things and it, it was interesting, you've got interesting organisations, how people interact and most important of all, one of the themes that comes through into my later life very much was how do you manage both a democracy and 
a work doing organization. The contradictions between the democratic association which made all the decisions for the keyboards and the need to actually do things and have an organization. And the organization was built on a sort of uh, a hierarchy of which was not, there was no money, no payment or anything like that. But nevertheless, we did require an organization. Um, I spent a couple of years in the army. Um, and it, it, just an aside that I only realized when I was doing this, the relevance for all sorts of things happening today. It was quite remarkable because it was a unit based on kibbutz members. So you all went in together at the same time with your friends. And to the best of my recollection, the officers were also elected or were proposed by the groups of sort of suitable people. So it, was all, it all came from the bottom, which was quite remarkable if I think back of it. Uh, to sum up, it was what I would call a character forming uh, period, particularly because my first neighbor was a native born Israeli who kept snakes in his room. And we were living next door in a, a sort of wooden hut and the snakes were continually, they were poisonous by the way, to continually uh, escaping. He'd been bitten twice. The local hospital knew him very well. Uh, he was hoping to be bitten a third time because apparently you get immunity when you do that. Um, anyway, we turned back, family crisis, I'm not going to go there, to England, got involved in a political career as a representative of, of one of the uh, Labour Party in Israel, got to know lots of politicians here, became totally disillusioned with politics and politicians at that point, it was enough for anybody, and uh, did a doctor at the same time. And um, really from that doctrine, sort of bringing it up to date, was the sort of realisation, but not deep enough to do anything about it, of the sort of, sort of contradiction I mentioned between organisation and democracy. And the other one that came up, which was relevant for the voluntary sector as well, was the fact that taking, hiring paid staff caused enormous problems. Some of you who know the voluntary sector will begin to sort of get hold of that problem. The clash between people working in an association and sort of coming in with paid staff. And um, I've noted for myself here that I didn't really understand most of this because as a result of the family crisis, which got worse, I, just, I had to leave. We had to leave. I, had a, my, I was married with two young children. And I sort of saw a job was going at Brunel University and um, joined Brunel. How am I doing, by the way? Because I've lost time here. Sorry? Oh, I've done 15. I thought you were going to say 15 minutes. Okay. Um, here I get to the more academic stuff. I've sort of painted the background, but I've sort of drifted into, into Brunel University, although I had come across the works of Elliot Jacks towards the end of my thesis, and I thought a lot of the things he was saying made a sense. He had a lot of um, attributes um, and way of approaching organizations which appealed to me. Essentially, Elliot Jacks, who is probably one of the most unknown people in the academic world. Has anybody here ever heard of him, other than those who have worked with me? You have done, yes. Or you... Okay, perhaps afterwards you might mention it. But I, he wrote a seminal book on organizations. He's got enormous influence today. There's a whole society of academics and um, consultants who work around the world, there are hundreds of them, uh, on the basis of his theory or theories. He was a pioneering psychoanalyst, uh, founded or was a co-founder of the Tavistock Institute, um, founded also one of the founders of the journal Human Relations uh, and used a methodology which appealed to me because it was a collaborative uh, methodology based on his psychoanalytic experience and that collaborative methodology I think works very well if you're interested in organisations, organisational change and the nature of people as well. He had set up um, an organization. He was appointed head of the uh, School of Social Sciences at Brunel. He'd set up an organization called BIOS, the Brunel Institute of Organization and Social Studies, uh, which comprised about three or four research units, all concerned with the public sector. So I was part of the Social Services Department um, research unit. 
And um, one of the things I liked about him, apart from the methodology, and I'll move very, very quickly on to what he, he stood for, um, was in fact, uh, I was looking at the, uh, the, his obituarism, the Guardian, amongst other things, said he was undistracted by human resource fads. So I thought about that, and I think this is something that stayed with me. I was never, as an academic in the years afterwards, terribly interested in government um, policies which were primarily slogans, which had no internal coherence. And this is of all political parties, and were really, I was always disappointed and unhappy when academics followed the slogans and tried to make sense of them, which invariably we all fell flat on our faces, as we know from the third way and big society, and I'm maybe, you know, I'm being rather unfair, but I don't think either of them uh, have justified the effort that many people put in, into that. By the way, Elliot Jacks, just for those who don't know, um, apart from anything else, was the inventor of the midlife crisis. That was his... Um, <laughs> I think he's probably known for that more than he's known for, any, for anything else. But nobody knows that. I mean, if you go around and ask, who, you know, who, who, who's the author, who's the inventor of the Midnight Crisis, I think uh, you won't get the answer. But he was, trust me. Um, I got on well with him. He believed on the clarity of concepts, which is obvious from... Uh, what I've said so far, I think. But I think he found my background somewhat exotic and interesting, given his interest in people and communities. I mean, he, he was uh, an interesting character in, his, in, in himself. And uh, I think when I left the keyboards, I ended up with certain personal characteristics, which my friends and colleagues have, have accused me of for telling me about being rather more than necessarily direct to the point. So, so I'm looking at those who know me well. Rather direct and um, sort of uh, a few other things of that sort, um, which has got me into trouble over the years, one way or another. Where's my gizmo? Coming on to the sector, and today in, in a way, um, Jax was teaching something incredibly powerful, and I mention this here because although you might not be interested in organization, in organizations, we all live in them. Uh, we're all influenced by them. Many of us work in them. Many, many of us suffer from the impact of poor organizations. And Jax really, his area of, and I'm not sure if he's come out on the screen. Uh, how do I get that? To, whoops. For some reason it doesn't like it, but inside that triangle um, was a whole hierarchy in the bureaucracy. A lot of Jack's work focused on the bit here. He was interested in this, but really his models were taken from the private sector. Now I, I'd like you, if you can, to keep in mind that everything I'm saying now has an, imp has, have, has an implication really for current debates as well in terms of, because a lot of powerful forces still hold this model. It's really, I suppose, what you might call the management is management model, and his focus is on this, and the nature of association. It is not, it isn't, it isn't the association as we know it. It's really the group of people who are the board. And what he did, fundamentally, and it was a very powerful anti-bureaucracy analysis of the bureaucracy. He said most organizations have far too many grades, doesn't necessarily apply to the, to the university, but it might do in the days of expansion and so on, and administration and so on. Um, really, we can tease this out, we can sort it out. There are different levels of work. Each of these represents a different level of complexity. He used the phrase time span of uh, discretion, which I won't bore you with. But basically, it was a statement that if you had too many, crowd, too many people crowded into the same space, of complexity, you'd end up in problems. You'd end up in bypassing, you'd end up in, in store managers, you'd end up in a uh, situation where people didn't know where the accountability was, you'd end up in confusion, you'd end up with too many meetings, and significantly, you would end up also 
with a huge range of personal problems and having now spent 40 or more years in organisations and see people distressed and crying literally because of the mess their organisation has got into by putting them in the wrong jobs, by giving them jobs that were too difficult for them or that were not sufficiently complicated for them. This is an, it was and is an incredibly powerful tool. I can't do justice to it, but the essential thing for this presentation was that it was essentially, sorry, it was essentially um, treating that as it. There were no sectors. The other person who influenced me very much, I, he was at, uh, on the staff here when I was at LSC in various incarnations, but um, I never met him, never spoke about him. Later I discovered him, and the, the thing that I was most impressed with, and I can say this in literally 30 seconds, with his idea about problem-driven theory, in that you begin with problems, you then put up a tentative theory, you then eliminate this, the look at what's right and wrong, both scientific and logical. So you could have a logical development theory and you end up with another higher level of problem which hopefully solves more problems and wider problems than you started off with. And wonderfully he called his biography Unended Quest. And the link for me between this and today is also the what's happening in the research community and academic community in terms of pressures for rapid delivery, for where the problems come from and the direction of the current sector uh, and so on. Because this is that, the exact opposite. And I very much followed this with the sort of determination of my former dog who was a Jack Russell Terrier and was able to grab a bone and hold onto it or a piece of stick before, you know, forever die first and that's I th think that humans take after their dogs so rather reinforce my tendencies anyway I suspect um, third person last person and the, m significantly again I never met Edmund Leach who was a, of course a very famous or was a very famous anthropologist um, was his overlapping circles between A and, and non-A and I, it was a revelation to me. I hadn't seen a Venn diagram like that. And I have, I think, well, I don't know, I could be stand corrected here, but I think I was the first, one of the first people to use it uh, for organisational purposes. I just leapt on it and I thought, and one of the reasons I um, sort of took it up was, was um, the fact that we had been doing quite a lot of... Um, discussions and meetings um, um, with people from the voluntary sector and as you will see shortly many of these throw up the problems of sector and the firstly being different to uh, the bureaucracy and trying to understand why there were so many tensions and problems but what Leach was saying was that the area here which I now call hybridity but he called ambiguity and I called it that as well in the beginning was one of tensions uh, and sort of problems. But I'll try and move on and, and, and do that. By the way, if anybody wants to interrupt, I don't know what the style of the seminars here. Do you prefer me to finish or? Yeah, okay. Well, I moved to Brunel and um, I'll come back to the leech thing uh, later. And when I got there, I found that, as I said, I was a member of the <coughs> social services research unit and the other units were education and the big unit was health and we were all primarily dealing with what I called, I wrote a book on this in 84 called welfare bureaucracies um, which really was the British scene at that time was dominated by government organisations I as a youngster certainly expected the university to provide you know that my university education was being provided by the state the state was dominated. I think it's difficult to appreciate how much in the early 70s the entire academic world was dominated by the notion of state services. The Social Administration Association, which was the premier intellectual association for anybody interested in social policy, 
had never mentioned the voluntary sector uh, in this period until about 1975. I used to go regularly, it was the only thing to go to. And after a while, when I sort of became more interested in the voluntary sector, and I'll come to that in a second, for the first time I remember somebody standing up, it might even have been me, I don't remember who was standing up, and actually mentioned the voluntary sector, and people looked around with them in, in, in amazement. Um, well, it was a desert. The, the academics, there were always individual scholars. Um, please, please don't um, mistake what I'm saying here. Of course there are individual scholars, but there's a, as a, based in a university, very few, isolated, no association, and that's why I've called it the desert. In 1978, um, we set up at Brunel University um, what we call PortVac, which is Program Research and Training into Voluntary Action, I think. Can't remember. Voluntary Action? You can remind me. Was it that, Colin? I've got a, somebody who was there at the time. Community, I don't think we use. I did write a paper on community in 1975. Now, you have to imagine this situation. I'm sitting in an, an institute which is 99.9% full of people who are concerned with the public sector. And I just, just want to check, I don't sort of deal with this on the following uh, slide, but I suddenly, as part of my social services. Uh, work suddenly found what were called the voluntary service uh, liaison officers. I don't know if anybody remembers these, but these were people whose job it was from the social services departments to go out and, as the name suggests, liaise with the community with the voluntary organisations. Now it's like rather like Edmund Leach, who worked primarily, I think, with obscure uh, tribes. I'm right? I'm looking. We have an expert in the field here. So <laughs> I'm looking over my left shoulder here. But it was rather like finding a new sort of tribe for an academic, sort of stuck out there. Uh, uh, and I just sort of became absorbed by the, the difference and wrote a paper for my colleagues in, in BIOS. We also started running workshops in Paul Back. And we go and I think we've got at least one person who came along to a workshop in Foster over there. And we um, began to gather a, a lot of information of real problems and real things happening in voluntary organisations. And it rapidly became clear, I think, that the standard earlier non-sector non model, are you with me? The, the, no, that sort of Jackson thing I pointed out, the pyramid, management is management, just did not result, uh, um, respond to the problems of the voluntary sector. Um, so uh, it was at that point actually that I sort of had seized on the work of Edmund Leach, used the, the overlapping circles. I actually believe it was Foster, he denies it, we met some months ago, but I think it was Foster or somebody else who said, who first said, look, it doesn't work, this one model, for voluntary agencies, because there are all these overlapping roles. You can be a member of staff, you can be also be a member of the board, you can be a client and be a member of staff, you can be a client. And every permutation you can think of, we found there, the whole thing just didn't make sense based on Jax's uh, theory. And of course, the tension with paid staff. And you may find this difficult to believe, but I still uh, didn't make the connections with my earlier life in the keyboard. So I'd become so absorbed by the bureaucratic theory that I just didn't see the connections way back. And it's only recently that I've started putting the whole thing together. And if I come to the end of the story quickly, I suddenly recently realized, of course, when I came into contact with the social enterprise literature then, and found that they were using the keyboards as the archetypical social enterprise and historic sort of, um, what, what would you call it? Uh, bearers of all the good things of social enterprise. I thought, yes, <laughs> if only I'd had a theory of hybridity and knew about all this thing back then. Um, who knows? But I didn't. Um, so 
we began, I began sort of uh, getting extremely, ex increasingly unhappy at Brunel. The thing was collapsing. Elliot Jacks uh, moved on back to the States, I think, or to Canada, where he was from. Um, the University Brunel, um, let me put it this way, the Institute was, was a nice home, it was a comfortable home. Jax was a great teacher. Brunel, however, was a di different kettle of fish. I'm not sure I'm mixing my metaphors here. Um, it, well, one of the things that sticks in my memory is that we were in the um, porter cabins, you know, the sort of porter cabins, you remember them, on the other side of the road. A lot of people are nodding their heads here. I think there are more than one person that's been there. <laughs> You're nodding your head. Um, whereas the real university, the sciences, were on the other side of the road. So, actually, I, don't, I think I met in 15 years at Brunel, I think I met the Vice-Chancellor once, and as I recollect whatever he said to me, it wasn't very flattering about the institution. It was something along the lines of what are you science, science, social science people doing here at Brunel at the time. So it was not a very comfortable place, and it was also, as you will see, quite a... That is taken from the Clockwork Orange, which was filmed at Brunel, which I thought most apposite, really, because it felt a bit like the clockwork orange if you cross the path. Um, so, I'm on the left there, as you can see. <laughs> That's the great escape. Basically, what happened at the time, and this is interesting from the way in which institutions institutions sort of get built and eventually some die and so on, is that there was pressure at the, on the LSE at the time in the um, 60, 70, 7, 78 period from external people, including um, now Lord Joffe and others, saying to the LSE, well, if you are really what you say you are, why haven't you got anything on the voluntary sector? So the LSE was getting agitated at the time, and I had the only unit in the world. We were the world's first research and postgraduate teaching um, uh, unit. Uh, so people from the LSE approached me and gave me great pleasure. And I put down Schadenfreude here. <laughs> Um, of my brief notes. Foundations were very supportive. I have very good friends, people I've done research projects with, consultancy projects with, and people in uh, uh, business people but with running large foundations who were very receptive to the notion that what's the point of us giving millions to the voluntary sector and charities if actually we haven't got a clue what they're doing with it and how they're being run or anything else. Um, I, I, this is all terribly difficult to imagine, I think, if you think what's going on at the moment. There were no journals. There was not a single... Well, there was one American journal uh, around just before this time. Nothing in this country. If I'm mistaken, please yell. But there certainly weren't any academic journals and very few else. There was certainly nothing that could be compared to what exists today. There were no consultants of, well, no, NCVO set up a consultancy arm around uh, about this time, a little, maybe a little, a little later. But basically, today, if you pick up a newspaper, there are armies of lawyers and others who are into it, no fun fundraising institution and so on. And basically, um, it was the desert that I portrayed a little earlier in, an early, in a previous slide. The Schadenfreude comes, and I'm not sure whether I should be saying this, but I will say this anyway, uh, because I transferred, the unit was transferred to the LSE from Brunel and arrived at the LSE, and you are now, I'm sure, wondering uh, who this is. <laughs> what is he doing on my map? Well, <laughs> in stark contrast to the way I was received at the LSE, two or three weeks after, at uh, uh, Brunel, sorry, when I arrived at the LSE, two or three weeks after arriving, I got an invitation 
to join the director and two senior academics to meet the king of Lesotho. Now, I have to be honest, I had no idea where Lesotho was, which is an awful embarrassment, an awfully embarrassing statement to make on television. I may have to cut it out later. But basically, what it did was put into perspective the way the social science university would treat this. He was a, a sort of a lovely man apart, apart from that. So, um, there I was at the LSE. And we began, I put building a national centre. I think that was really the ambition that you had to have and that I wanted anyway if you were at the LSE. The difference between the move to the LSE was not only meeting the King of the Soto, but within a few days of my arriving there, the Times newspaper arrived um, to write an article on the move. The whole sort of influence, contacts and so on of the centre were dramatically improved at that time. However, the LSE as such had some difficulty absorbing the centre. And here you get into sort of institutional stuff, really. It was a teaching and research centre. It should have been called an institute under the current or then later LSE um, policy, but the policy didn't exist. And we found ourselves, to a degree, caught in the middle of that. In other words, the expectations on the centre were everything, both to be doing a pretty full teaching load and to be... Uh, providing research and being at the top of the research game and to be raising funds for our centre itself and for any future initiatives and so on. So it became um, quite tricky. The department... Anybody know who that is? Richard Tate. Yeah. Sorry. That sounded terribly pedantic when I realised I should really be asking that sort of question here. But Richard Titmus and the members of the department were fondly known as Titmice. <laughs> and I, I say that with fondness, but it actually indicates the direction of the department at that time. So there was a, a somewhat uncomfortable relationship between the notion of everything should be provided or whatever by the state and state welfare, and those are coming along saying, hold on a minute, it's something all their voluntary sector. And actually, for some years, nobody apart from Jane, uh, Martin Boomer was there, and he, of course, was well known, and uh, I've used him uh, a lot. But I don't remember, he seemed to have left rather early. I can't remember him being there for a great many years, overlapping my time. And Jane Lewis later um, got interested in the voluntary sector. And, um, but on the whole, it was primarily dominated by that. Um, The, the department as well um, had problems about how they handle the money. What they didn't realise, I don't think ever realised, because the LSE had no historic memory um, at all, and some, especially where finance was concerned. And what they failed to realise after a while was I had actually raised the money uh, ably um, assisted by Margaret Harris, who was um, part of the Portfact team, and I ought to mention, of course, um, uh, Colin, who's here, um, they didn't realise that I'd raised the money for tenured posts, which included the cost of the salaries, because that was the whole point. And, of course, that, that did cause some problems, and I'll move on. But as far as the centre was concerned, the centre was in the business of providing a, a, a master's degree which was fairly well subscribed although of course much cheaper than today we had our first PhD students we had, I had about five or six by the end of it we produced research which was published in academic uh, journals influence I have mentioned and again Colin and Margaret were instrumental in setting up the voluntary sector what's it called? Study Network. Who dreamt that one up? It's nearly as bad as Portback, isn't it? BSSN. Okay. So it had a, a quite a lot of in, uh, influence. Also, we um, 
were able to influence a, a continuous stream of people coming in from around the world who sought advice about the nature of the unit and how could they replicate this in Australia and elsewhere. So it was in fact the first model which was then sort of gathering pace as it were, had a knock-on effect, there's a more elegant word than that, or phrase than that, and influenced a large number of other uh, centres. There was, there were a few um, oppositional forces in the school coming from two different directions, both then and slightly afterwards. One was the feeling by some of our academics who rather had their noses in the air, who regarded it as a consultancy, that if you were actually helping organisations and you were raising the money to actually finance the unit, not making money out of it, that this was somehow consultancy. They had no sort of understanding of this. And this came back to by me in particular and other people uh, years later. And from the other extreme were those who felt that this was managerialism. In other words, both in public in terms of their writings and privately in terms of our discussions, they saw being anybody who studied organizations and actually used the word bureaucracy, even though it was precisely defined, I should have defined it for, for Jack's the bureaucracy was not bureaucracy in terms of the uh, pejorative sense of the thing. It was quite precisely um, defined, as you would expect from what I said about his um, obituary, in terms of the hierarchy of paid staff. Nothing more, nothing less. And he was vigorously against too many layers, inefficiencies, the rest of it. He was the most effective anti-bureaucratic writer and implementer that I know and I would challenge anybody to sort of uh, put a different case for that. But nevertheless, we were tainted with the, uh, what was it, tar of bureaucracy or something, um, and that also did damage from various sources. So there was that issue. But on the whole, um, I think we were. bunnies. Um, I think so. I mean, it certainly whilst I was there, of course, they were, everybody was happy, there were no problems, and it was absolutely wonderful. But I think, um, more seriously, I think there is still a major issue about what is going to happen to voluntary sector uh, studies. Can it be part of another department? If it's part of a business school, what are the implications? And how do you handle departmental rivalries? Particularly, we met opposition from the government department as well at the LSE, and at one point were publicly, in an open public meeting like this, accused by the professor of local government, again, shall remain nameless, of actually, um, I think I've got witnesses to this. I'm looking. No, you weren't? Okay. This is unwitnessed, therefore may have to be scrubbed unless I can find somebody to sort of uh, say this. But I remember, clear as daylight, accusing us of taking his job away because the voluntary sector was going to replace the local sort of area of whatever it was. We, I, you know, it, yes, I can see everybody saying, oh, yes, exactly. I mean, what on earth was that all about? Never mind, it didn't do me any good at all. How am I doing? Okay. Some of the theory may not to your unhappiness, this will not come back. The US connection was part, if you like, of an international... We had got ourselves established nationally, but the US connection was part of naturally being at the LSE, a sort of global university, with connections, in the, particularly in the developing world um, and um, in, in the United States. The first move, I think, was to establish connections with the US. And in 1986, I went to conference of AVAS, which was Association of Voluntary Action, whatever. Scholars. What was it called? Scholars. Scholars, I know. And that was still the name then. It's now called Arnova. And I went to Harrisburg. I, I applied to go to the, the conference and suddenly found myself being earmarked to make the after dinner speech, which was the sort of pride of place, and I sort of absolutely nearly collapsed at the thought of going, I've never heard of them, know who they were, 
didn't know what they did, um, and whatever. Anyway, I went there, and they were totally, I was going to say bowled over, not by me necessarily, but the idea that anybody outside the States was doing anything. I mean, talk about being parochial. They just didn't realize what was going on. And I was embraced as a sort of long lost member of the family. And thereafter, stayed, we, I and colleagues were regular participants uh, at Unover meetings, uh, served on some of their boards and so on and so forth. In 1990, we organized at the LSE the first international meeting of Unova, and some of you may have been there. And this was a dramatic moment for them because it took Unova out of its comfort zone into the international arena. Um, one, there was one rather odd article about this whole um, CVO existence and so on, which accused us of not being international in dimension, whereas, as you will see, nothing could be further from the truth. So I use this opportunity of putting the record right if the person who made that silly accusation ever sees this video. Fine. Um, Where am I? 1992. Coming into more interesting stuff of relevance. Wherever possible, I'm, I'm sort of trying to uh, bring it up today because I think now I get to another point which is currently relevant for anybody who is concerned with the voluntary sector or third sector or whatever the various names are. This was in 1992. I went to an Nova conference. I can't remember where it was at. I think it was 1992 or one or two. And suddenly there was a at the, and at the AGM, large audience there, when people s started proposing the establishment of the, uh, of the society which would deal with international voluntary organizations. And the fighting, infighting between the two sides absolutely stunned me. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I sat there and I thought, hold on a minute, we've got Anova, it's doing very well, it's got more and more people coming from the international scene. Um, sort of member of the family almost, fine. You want to establish another organization, fine. But there are people who are literally um, at each other's uh, throats. And I always thought the American academics were so gentlemanly compared to <laughs> the British academics. So it's a real wake-up call. Um, and I stood up. I, you know, I've already made the point. I have a tendency of standing up and sort of march to the stage and said, you are being parochial. You are, there are people here from around the world. What, or, what is all this sort of internal strife? We didn't come here to listen to this stuff. So I found myself elected to the, inter, the interim founding board of what became ISTAR, International Society of Third Sector Research. And I claim, well, I certainly voted for that title against the, the national titles and voluntary, etc. Okay. The other key figure was Dennis Young, who became a, a friend of mine I can't remember how I met him, but he founded in, and this again is relevant. Now, I, I said that there would be today's relevance. The domain, I put domain struggle, I'm not sure that's the correct uh, phrase. The struggle between the titles, if you like, the philosophies and spread between institutions has carried on to this current day and has ramifications as if you looked at the recent uh, journal of uh, voluntary sector, what's it called for your... I've just read an article from it. Voluntary Sector Review. You see, VSR. I can't remember all these VSR. I've even forgotten. I think I forgot some of the other titles were around, but never mind. Um, the, it's actually relevant today, as you can see, because it's clear from the article that um, um, was written quite recently by um, uh, Antonin Vag Wagner. I'm confusing him with. Um, Wenger, this Anthony Wagner. Um, I'm glad somebody here has an inkling about football. <laughs> it's so depressing. Um, that's the other thing. I, I'm an, a football addict and surprised many of my students when I turned up at the old Highbury wearing my scarf and whatever it was and met a rather startled student thinking, what's this guy doing here? You know, it's not at all the image I had of him. Um, but I am and have been since my young days. Um, but the, the, the struggle goes on and I see that 
that really what we have today, just in case I don't get to the end point, is a proliferation of associations and journals, all of whom are competing and using the phrase that they are, if not a sector, on the way to becoming one. So you have now um, the civil society uh, group led by the John Hopkins uh, tribe and um, with vast sums of money, um, founders I think of Voluntas or whatever, the, um, I, I think I'm correct in saying that. Um, you have them, you then have ANOVA, uh, you have certainly, I don't think the, uh, the British Association is competing on uh, them, but you have the two others that are competing for sector titles, both civil society and also uh, social entrepreneurs, a uh, social enterprise, which I went to a conference on as well. So you've got this with their own journals, civil society, social enterprise. So th there's an issue here which is really probably for discussion rather than me to pursue there. Anyway, the Mandel Center was set up in 1984, uh, and for those who don't know, and I didn't know until I started thinking about this, was it closed a year ago, more or less at the same period of time as our own uh, center was founded in Portback. Again, raises issues about the longevity of individual, and the, the ability, let me put it this, the ability for individual units and centers and institutes to exist within the powerful disciplinary forces. And you're nodding your heads there. Um, Mandel failed, failed because what happened at Mandel, and in the end, last year, it moved across, was taken over by the Weatherhead School, which I think is Department of Management there, equal to that. So there are big issues here about that. But the important point was that Dennis and I cooked up the notion of a non-profit management and leadership journal which was founded in 19, whenever it was, 19. The other initiative we undertook, and this will take just two minutes, we then set up an NGO initiative because the school had terrific uh, links overseas, obviously, and for all points of view it made sense really to go that. The key thing um, that spurred me to really start that was reading the literature I'd uncovered that the problems that the NGOs were facing were the same list that we'd drawn up to found um, Port Vac and the CVO and I thought if they've got the same problems more or less, of course there are different problems but the guts of them organisationally were the same therefore there's a case here for drawing up uh, a, a, another course We'd undertaken research in the familiar fashion, got resources to undertake research with um, NGOs here, international NGOs here, and um, did a feasibility study, went round, saw whether there was some um, room for another course, and set up the first world's first NGO degree, got resources for a new post, and set up the first um, degree in 1995. I'm almost coming to the... Oh, I've got the theoretical bit here. How much time have I got? I need to... Don't. I was given 45 minutes. I've got an hour? I've done an hour. End of story, folks. Um, let, me, let me jump to the end. Sorry, I was, I was expecting somebody to start wrapping my knuckles. Oh, I'm, my apologies. Um, I will then not bore you with the whole... Um, well, I'll finish in two, two or three minutes, basically. Um, earlier I said we were a single bureaucracy, moved to associate... Well, let me go back one very briefly just to show the earlier one. <clears throat> My next theoretical step was to separate out bureaucracy from associations, add the personal world, families, friends, neighbours and so on. So I had bureaucracy... Sorry, I should be pointing up there, not at my screen. I had bureaucracies both of all sorts, government, private, whatever. I had associations, and I had the personal world. I, yeah, I can do it from here. I then, because of pressure from the United States, the discovery there was actually a private sector in existence. <laughs> but nobody had heard of the private sector in welfare. I mean, it really didn't exist. It's saying, now, I, I think a lot of people still don't. 
to unless they've got the money to pay for it, which <laughs> some of us have. Um, <laughs> develop the, the idea of ideal models between the public and the private sector and the third sector. Um, most important point, which I'm sort of emphasising more and more recently, is that the core of the third sector is its associations. And I'd argue today that the huge third sector is the huge number numbers in the third sector are overwhelmingly small and un unincorporated organisations. I think the NCBO recently published that the 600,000 out of the 900,000 or more were actually uh, those sorts of organisations. And many of the large organisations have their roots in what I would call associational values, which I don't have time to go into, but what I'm going to suggest is, if you want to hear more about this, <laughs> go and read that, okay? Um, so I've got that as the core in terms of associations, which has enormous impact for researchers, historians and everybody else, because if that's the case, we've all been focusing on the tip of the iceberg rather than the iceberg. Uh, and given that the, uh, the iceberg has provided the roots and in many cases still um, has the values um, of the, if you like, the highly bureaucratic part of the, this would be the highly, if you think about your third sector, this would be the hybrids in here, the third and the, um, maybe the public and the private sector across here, with large numbers of paid staff, hierarchies, genuine bureaucracy. Uh, I'm not sure quite where they get their, the case. It seems to me that the case for them depends on the values of the original association and so on. I can't, you can raise that. That's my view. And the point here is that I think in time the going gets rough, the organisations in all these sectors go back to their prime roots, they go back to where their prime ac accountability is. They can carry on for years, sort of, with be national treasures or be supported, but when things get, get tough, as we knew in the, uh, if you think I'm exaggerating, you just think of the, <coughs> the great crash and the role of uh, uh, Fanny Mae and Freddie Mac as hybrids and the failure of uh, sorting out who was accountable. They were sort of that. You think of the troubles in the BBC, I'm not sure what that organisation is. I don't know what universities are, but they're certainly hybrids if you think about it. And problems around the place there. So with that, final comment literally, I brought the personal world back into my current research and I'm very concerned about the boundary between that and these, particularly the third sector, and what goes in this territory now. And I am going to shut up, I think. I've got stuff, but forget it. Thank you. I'm um, sorry about that. Right? Really, um, um, just before we start our discussion, I just really wanted to say, in case somebody is thinking of leaving, that there will be drinks at the end. <laughs> so, um, so don't rush out when we're but if you haven't signed the attendance books, we'd be happy to be there. And there's also a national planning community here, which has a group of sit up here. So, shall we just have a discussion? Does it sound like to open? Can, can I? Sorry, no, no. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all these places. I was going to know. I mean, you were talking about the kind of hostility within, or the lack of understanding within university. It, it, it did actually ring bells with me because in a sense if you actually look at the, the way large sector organizations or large national bodies are, they're not particularly interested in the notion of the larger sector that you mentioned, of the vast bulk. It, it, it's almost a kind of hostility if you bring up large, you know, small, you know, bowling clubs and stuff. They, they really get, they get real hostile about it. And I just wondered if you had, had encountered that or thought about that. Um, well, the quick answer is that I'm as guilty as everybody else of spending most of my research time on precisely the sort of organisations I've just criticised. So, you know, and if you ask me why, it's because with a public sector background, spending 15 years or more, whatever, working with um, welfare systems or welfare bureaucracies, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, takes us into much deeper water is that the really critical problems 
at the present moment. The, the problems that are of concern, at least have been of concern, I use my, choose my words carefully here, have been the, the situation where people are in dire distress and where often large-scale resources, such as hospitals and others, are concerned, and where government can actually control. So government is interested primarily in having organisations not control ideologically, don't misunderstand me, but actually control um, in terms of organisational terms. Because how on earth do you have a policy, as we've seen recently, well, it's much more difficult to have a policy with all these sort of smaller organisations. So if they want quick results and so on, I suspect that's the way they go. There is, an inherit in this country, an inherited... Um, for right or for wrong, I no, don't want to comment on that, sort of, I wouldn't say prejudice, but sort of certain view, pro-government delivery view, which one encounters, um, which is fine, I probably share that with lots of people, but I'm not sure I've got to the essence of your question, you're asking about the rivalry. <coughs> I just wondered if the, the, the sort of conflicts which you experienced within an academic ah, context, okay. are they being replicated in, in the kind of practical world of, of voluntary organizations, a kind of, you know, a no. superiority of the large versus the small, or, or the, uh, those that have political, you know, service delivery centrality versus leisure organization, all the rest, basically. Well, I'm going to plead for the last few years, no sort of direct contact with the larger ones. I'd be much more interested in the smaller ones. I don't know is the answer to that. There are people here probably who can answer that far better I can than I can. I, I suspect, I'm not sure. If anybody wants to, please comment. I, I, I honestly don't know. Well, I'm speaking differently to that. Um, I Well, I try to, yes, I'm, I apologise if I've missed somebody out, but I, I, I suppose my experience, I taught community workers, and I, my, I get my feeling it wasn't quite the same um, interest in sectors and, as, uh, as that. I think they were using a different um, battery of approaches. I'm not sure they, they would see it as something to do with the voluntary sector. I think their ideology was... Was, was perhaps deeper in some ways about the roots of the, of the thing. But, you know, great. I'll amend the next paper if you send me the relevant references. <laughs> this thing about problems, remember I, for the beginning, problems, series, better problems, we're continually learning. Thanks. David. Oh, it's going to be an awkward one. Go on. An observation. <laughs> The observation, I went to Howard Lannister's lecture the other week on Richard Titmuss, who's someone I right. don't know very much about, but it just struck me that Richard Titmuss's relationship with the LSE was deeply problematic and sort of analogous in some ways to, to, to some of the experiences that you talked about, about being looked down upon for practical engagement and you know, some hostility from within the ivory towers. So it, it, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't know whether that's a sort of you know, reassuring or, 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 or depressing. Yeah. Well, depressing yeah. in the sense that there's anybody who is bringing new ideas, anybody who is yeah. innovating to some extent, is going to face these kind of oh, okay. things. Um, Do you, can I answer? It's the second question. Well, the question, the, yeah, the second is going to be a question. Yes. The, the question, I suppose, and probably historians hate this, and and people talking about life history propagated as well. But I'm, I'd be interested to know, you know, given some of the tensions that you highlight now around these different journals and these different niches in the way in which um, the voluntary sector studies community <coughs> has emerged, do you think there are things that might have been done differently or ways in which... 
you know, it could have been, some of that could have been avoided. Oh, well, there are two big questions in a way. Can I deal with the Titmus? I may have to ask you to refresh my memory, but I, I think I know where you're going about the journals and so on. Um, well, I actually met Titmus. I knocked on his door when I returned from Israel, and I hadn't yet started my PhD, and I was brash, as I mentioned, so I didn't make an appointment. And he was a giant at the time. I mean, whatever the other departments felt, he was absolutely the person in terms of social administration, what we call social policy now. So I just sort of knocked on the door and went in, sort of just come in, sat down and said, well, I'm thinking of doing a PhD. And his response was, why do you want to do a PhD? Go and write the book. The point here is, of course, that Richard Titmus did not have a doctorate. And if you're talking, I have no idea, it was not my period, but I suspect the fact that he didn't, did not help in the acad academic arena around him, all of whom probably had gone through the traditional academic paths, I don't know. You probably are right about social administration because later it came under criticism um, and was eventually dissolved after 20 years, came under criticism um, as a discipline and Pink, Bob Pinker wrote a book about it as well, came under criticism that it was sort of atheoretical, that there were no theories there. And to an extent that was, that was correct and therefore um, despite all his efforts, and also the whole discipline or area of um, social administration did what academics do when they get too close to sort of the grubby real world, is raise the title of their efforts to a greater degree of obscurity or uh, conceptualism. So it became social policy, and I'm sure somebody will find social policy is now under the attack and they'll become something even grander. Um, so, sorry, I perhaps ought not, not to have said that, but I think it was a great shame that social administration um, disappeared and the whole huge area whereby people were developing theories to respond to the needs of the, of the public almost is gone. I don't think we'd have gone into some of them cock-ups, and I can use that phrase since it's been on the BBC, um, that we would have got on if that whole stream had become more powerful rather than uh, the social policy stream. But then I'm prejudiced on this matter, I admit it freely. In terms of the tensions, could you refresh my memory on that one? I know it was between well, it was disciplines. Just the, sort of the, the world of these tribes that you mentioned. Yes, oh, I see the journals. Ah, oh, okay. I know you okay. don't like ecological organizations theory very much, but. There are these niches, and, and, and you know, yeah. I wonder if that's one of the explanations. Yeah. Do you think it could have been avoided? Um, I don't think there's any great crisis at the moment. Sorry if I've given the crisis feeling, but I think what's happened is that there are the niches. Look, there are two, I haven't got an answer in a sense because I think we're right in the middle of it. There are two um, approaches. One, you could say, let a thousand flowers bloom. This is a niche, let's have. Um, social enterprise, let's have civil society. Great. Uh, my problem is one problem and one problem only. On what is the basis, what is the theory and basis for these new journals and whatever. Now I spent the last year, because I, I saw, recently gave a paper on social enterprising, reading the social enterprise literature. It's taken me most of a year. And I went to a conference at Liège of 250 or so social enterprise academics from about 10 or 15 countries. And the chairman, it was a man, who was leading a delightful French um, academic professor who said, if you gave me a week, a month, or six months, I couldn't actually tell you what social enterprise, what the definition is. My friend, um, Dennis Young, wrote in an essay in a recent book on social enterprise, um, what did he call it? Um, mishmash. I would call it a dog's dinner. And the whole conference of 200 or more academics was really trying to make sense of it. I can make sense of it, <laughs> as you would expect. There's no false modesty here. And um, because I think they're all talking about organizations and hybrid organizations, and you could have perfectly rational, but they don't have a theory. 
nor does civil society. Well, you were around. Could you understand the definition? When I left, it was called the Centre of a Civil Society. I read the opening, the page of description. It's half a page long. And I defy anybody of sane mind to understand what that was all about. And I, when I looked at the civil society stuff as well, I, I went to look at the civil society journal and the writings, and it's, a, well, according to one author, it's going to be the biggest whatever it is since anybody started writing, literally started writing with pen and pencil or whatever, or slate and whatever it was. Um, but there is no agreed definition. Now, maybe there's something there, and I, I don't want to be too dismissive. All I'm saying is, what bothers me is not the flowering of the thousand flowers, but the flowering of a large number of things, and I don't know whether they're weeds, flowers, or whatever they are. Fortunately, the good news is that most people in those various niches still speak to each other, interchange, and the reality at the moment is still there is an overarching framework of people interested in that. Sorry, too long an answer. Um, I'm interested in the sort of basis of splits and fragmentations that following David's question really the you know, the camps, the tensions, why people were splitting at that stage, you know, the, the different power bases if you like, and then then actually sort of quite a bit of research has grown and come together and you've got International development areas also coming together under the ISTR, the International Society for the Architecture Research label and conference and so on. So there's sort of things coming together and, and then splitting again. And I, I, I know that Robert McMillan also has written about this sort of, you know, the current fragmentation as things are shifting. And I'm now coming back to your comments on civil society and we'll try and get a question out of this. But in a sense why labels and you know it seems to me that both community and community development work has also sort of come back in with another label. Um, you know that was sort of it may not have been part of the kind of frame that you're particularly focusing on, but it in a sense it was another camp in parallel. Um, and, and now you've got policy-wise uh, an office for civil society and my own theory is that, that that's actually uh, impinging more on the associational world, uh, social welfare, behaviours, etc. Government policy is impinging. And I don't know whether, you know, that this sort of what you label and how that actually then gets within or without different frames, whether research frames, policy frames, I don't know whether you've got the kind of thought about that. Did that make any sense to you? <laughs> Sorry. I'm it makes sense, and just, I, I'm just, I'm too young, I'm too young to do another doctorate. <laughs> I mean, that's a sad fact, and I suspect that a doctorate <laughs> is, is required to answer that, and I'm looking at the thing. I, I don't know, it's a hell of a question. I mean, partly there are there are ideologies around. If you've read, I've forgotten the journal name, but the, the voluntary start, oh, uh, voluntary sector review. Uh, this is a this is the problem of reaching what is now an advanced age. I know you don't believe it, but it is. <laughs> and the voluntary, let me write that down so I don't want the sector review. If you read the article by Antonin, which is long, complicated, and almost unreasonable, unreadable. And um, read my response. You get a sense of the almost bitterness and unfairness, in a way, in which he attacks the John Hopkins or Johns Hopkins is it what Johns Hopkins um, enterprise and their emphasis on non-profits. And it, it is quite tough. Um, and I think, and is ignoring totally the British view whereby our approach, which we haven't spoken about, <clears throat> really, I think, embraces the, the two wings of both political and actually um, service delivery. We've always assumed in this country that the two go together. That you, and the current discussion on the uh, politicization of uh, 
charities and so on fits right in here. We've always assumed that. And, <clears throat> and he's arguing, coming from a political view, is that um, really the, the whole American um, sort of approach led by um, Lester Salomon and others has really played down and has taken over civil society title without doing justice to the civil society origins which were political rather than economic. So that's sort of his argument that became quite, become quite fierce. And I also confide to you that in the book, which my two at least some colleagues who contributed to the book, which I edited on back there, I should have emphasized that, um, that um, <clears throat> in the book, which, which got very good reviews, um, as an aside, a, a guy who reviewed in one journal, who gave a nice review but said, I can't understand why you're still talking about the third sector and not about civil society organisations. And I felt like saying, you prat, I mean, I'm not into um, civil society. Um, that's not a title I understand. But there's something going on there, in which case, you know, titles being rephrased. Now, it, the answer is it may be political, it may be institutional in the sense that a hell of a lot of money has been poured into the American universities and, and the banking, I don't know. Um, I couldn't say much more. What else? Maybe somebody else has got a view of what's going on. Interesting times, that's for sure. No one going to come and... I can talk about it for hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not hours, so don't yeah. stop you. Well, somebody yeah. over there wants to talk. Well, no, it's just the, the, the relabeling issue. I mean, it can be understood on a number of levels, can't it? And one of them is just that there is this endless need to, you know, for novelty and reinvention, which I think we see in so many areas mm. of life. And I think this is just another one. I mean, nobody agrees what civil society is particularly, but it's necessary every so often to to reinvent these labels, and that they there's a you know the whole the whole world of, of academic research and to some extent professional worlds depends on, first of all, identifying your sort of terrain and then labelling it and then claiming expertise over it until somebody else comes along and wants to, to start again, you know. So I think there's a lot in that. Couldn't disagree more, actually. Um, I, <clears throat> I think if you do that, I, I, I recognise that reality, but I'm coming from a different approach is relabeling, to me, doesn't make much sense without the critical thing is what problems are these people trying to resolve? I mean, is it their own desire for academic advancement? Is it their desire to seek favour from whoever's funding? What is the point of relabeling if the, sa if the same th problems are being um, addressed? I think there is something to civil, so civil society, and I'd happily change the civil society. So don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not precious about it. I mean, I've published under the title of non-profits, I've published under the title of voluntary sector agencies, I've written something on social enterprise, I'd happily, but my next year's task, um, uh, really we were to look at that, happily do that, to see if I could try and make some sense and understand what problems aren't being faced by civil society that justify the title. If I could see, read that, I'd sign up and join. I think they're all just the same. They're just interchangeable names for the same problem that you are fundamentally I'm, interested in. Oh, that's in. interesting. You're switching to the other side. Now that, that's, um, I'm not sure they are, because I think civil society is getting into a political area. Well, OK, we, you're right. You could talk for hours, we could talk for hours. Sorry, there was a gentleman over there. I think I know, but I can't remember. Um, my name's John Plotton, and I, I worked in LC twice. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, do I need to duck under the I've table? For 11 years, but I've worked on the fundraising side. And, and right. um, so, f first of all, I just want to say um, this is an absolutely wonderful um, talk by you. And I could have listened, I'm sure all of us could have listened to another hour or two. And then I'm sure the discussion would have gone on for even more hours. So, it was really great. I'm still coming to this as somebody who was started out life as a medieval historian, did a lot of research fundraising for many years, and I'm now going back into um, looking academically at philanthropy, um, I put uh, inverted commas around it, and uh, I 
I'm looking at an uh, interaction of fundraisers and um, uh, professional fundraisers, paid fundraisers, part of the bureaucracy, and um, uh, and donors, potential donors. And so I sort of returned to literature and the kind of description of fragmentation is one which I came across very quickly because I was talking to some people in the Centre for um, Centre for Charity Giving and Philanthropy who got an event this evening um, in the Charter House on the history of philanthropy. And um, uh, it was very obvious to me that um, some fundamentals of work on, say, the anthropology of the gift and of giving weren't known to people who were working away on mm. philanthropy. And it sort of puzzled me. And the, the lack of history, uh, is, um, the lack of historical like memory of um, how the sector or sectors have changed and um, are, seems to be, well, well, not as deeply rooted as I would have thought, uh, expected. And so, anyway. I haven't really got a question for you, but this is really, I thought it was really interesting, there's so much here, um, what you said. I think of the thing about the words, Dave was talking about labels, and it does strike me that there's always battles uh, for having a word right. that you then own and that you colonise, and philanthropy right. is, is certainly one of those. Who, who owns good giving and um, what does it mean and who's excluded, and um, I just sort of throw that into the mix. So, as a non-academic who's kind of coming back and looking at the same thing. I'll answer in a sentence, and then because there are several other people who want to talk. The, um, the, the la what bothers me is not only the lack of historical memory; it's also the lack of academic memory, mm -hmm. yes. which is that you find now um, writers, and I do quite a lot of reviewing for journals, where the whole batch is, and that's a real problem. We, we have time to go into, but I take your point. Good. Uh, uh, Robert Bellin, um, Really interesting to kind of hear you talk through both the history uh, and then the kind of theoretical ways at the end. And I just wondered what role you might imagine in your theoretical thinking uh, for a more kind of field or domain type understanding of uh, organisations. Because your, your, your view is based around sectors and those sectors uh, originating kind of core principles and values. Uh, and then there's a kind of blurry boundaries, so there's a kind of hybridity argument that comes around and after that. But out of that story, or things that get written out of that story, are where um, organisational purposes to do with, say, for example, if you're involved in health or if you're involved in yeah. education, the field, or housing, yeah. or something, the kind of field type structures, do they have no bearing on the kinds of uh, thinking that you want to promote? Well, I didn't, I mean, I just cut in five minutes, sort of, <laughs> 25, 30 years of thought about it, and I'm, I'm not trying to sort of in any way avoid it, but yeah, of course. But if you look at the book there, you'll find that people um, from a whole range of different fields sort of use the theories, and, or try to use them or not. So, yeah, I mean, if, it, if somebody from a, a field theory or other theories comes up and offers an insight, fine. But I suppose, as I said, I'm a bit like the Jack, Jack Russell Terrier, and then there's so much more um, to get out of this lot. If this, if this got boring for me, and if I didn't feel it kept solving additional problems, I mean, why would I go and look in another, go to another um, sort of uh, mine and start excavating down that mine? And today, it's not that easy, Rob, you know, as you know. You move to another field, you've got to spend three years getting up to scratch with the literature. I'd rather do my own literature and develop this and find people, hope that people find it useful. I mean, as a hobby, I track who's using it in which country. <laughs> the last one I looked at was the, the Home Guard in Denmark, or somebody, which you might think is a bit obscure, but I mean, somebody's doing a PhD using the material to understand the tensions between the volunteers. Uh, and the regular army in Denmark. Well, oh, great. Uh, so I'm happy. I'm a happy bunny. I, I, I'll let the field people get on with their field and the anthropologists, who I have great admiration for, of course, there. So, yeah. Sorry. Foster, love to see. Shall we have a drink? Shall we have a drink? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, the discussion in a vertical position, I guess. Yeah, thank you.